You know, God calls each of us to himself for one specific reason. What is that reason? We'll talk about that and more. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. Quick Study is a television program that takes you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And we're excited to begin the book of Zechariah. This is very interesting. Corey, what did you do today? Some specific people groups in the Bible today. Excellent. And what did you do today? A fabulous Friday question, so get ready. Fabulous Friday question. All right, very good. Ryan, uh, what did you study? Well, today I'm taking on two alleged Bible contradictions in 1 Samuel, one of which is this. How could Samuel be sleeping in the temple when the temple wasn't built until much later? All right, that's a really good question. God calls each of us to himself for a specific reason. What is that reason? We'll talk about that and more. Get your Bible guide and your Bible, the most important book of all, because it is God's Word. There are many, many different people groups that are mentioned in the Bible, talked about, you know, interacted with, with the people of God. So today you and I are going to be focusing in on a very interesting people group. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Cushites and Cush today. Now, the Cushites really interacted all throughout the Old Testament, so take a look at some of them today. The nation of Cush was located south of Egypt along the Nile River and is referenced 54 times in the Bible. The Egyptian name for Cush meant land of the bow, and although it may reference the obvious turning of the Nile River into the shape of a bow through Cush's land, it also references what seems to have been the Cushite's weapon of choice. An early grave excavated in Cush housed an occupant that was buried with his bow in hand and a series of 40 small statues depicting Cushite archers was unearthed in an Egyptian tomb. From written records, Cush became known for their military training. Cushites served as mercenaries in many different armies. The Amarna letters tell of Cushite troops manning Egyptian military outposts in Canaan, which would have put them face to face with Israelites in the time of the conquest and judges. By the time of King David, there were Cushites in Israel's army as well. After the defeat and death of David's son Absalom, it was a Cushite soldier who told David the news. Sometimes, however, the Israelites and Cushites found themselves on opposite sides. During the reign of Judah's King Asa, a war was fought and won against Zerah the Cushite. During the days of Hezekiah, an alliance was struck with the kings of Cush, who had also become kings of Egypt. In the 8th century BC, the kings of Cush successfully invaded Egypt, claimed kingship, and established the 25th dynasty of Egypt. These Cushite pharaohs established trade with the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser, who wanted Cushite horses for his military chariots. Evidence from Assyria even suggests that they employed Cushites in the keeping and training of these horses. But this trade didn't keep peace between Cushite Egypt and Assyria. Pharaoh Terhaka, a Cushite pharaoh named in the Bible, was King Hezekiah's ally and marched against Assyria when they attacked Judah. Though Terhaka was the last Cushite pharaoh, Cush continued on in their military importance, and Ebed Melech, a Cushite working as a high official in Jerusalem, had the power to confront King Zedekiah, change his mind, and rescue the prophet Jeremiah. One of the things that I love most about studying biblical history is that History brings back in the human element to uh, your study of the scriptures, to reading through the scriptures. For example, here in the case of Cush and the Cushites, there are many different Cushite people who are mentioned in the scriptures. Uh, you know, Ebed Melech, who, who we see in, in the accounts of Jeremiah. Uh, and it's so easy when we're reading through the Bible, when we don't have context for the nationalities of these people, who they are, where they come from, what their people are known for. Uh, it's really easy to just go, okay, yeah, that was just a guy who knew Jeremiah and who saved him. But once we know their cultural background, we know a little bit more about the dynamics that they would have had living, the social dynamics that they would have had living in the ancient city of Jerusalem, then we can begin to imagine what it would be like for us as a Cushite living in Jerusalem. And that really connects with us on a deeper level than just reading a story in the Bible or reading a history in the 
Bible would be a more appropriate way to say it. At that point, we can connect with these uh, ancient people that we're reading about. And that connection, that emotional connection, that human connection can help us understand the theological lessons, the lessons about God's character that God was revealing to the people that we read about in these histories. So just one very cool element of studying biblical history. Israel's return occurred when Cyrus was king. He declared the people taken from their homeland could return to it. And the first group departed in 537 BC. At that time, an altar to God was set up. The temple rebuild did not really start until 536 BC. There was opposition to the rebuilding of the temple and it halted for 16 years. The people lost their desire for the work of God in his temple. So God raised up two prophets under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, who claimed the people needed to restart their work. Haggai and Zechariah were commissioned in 520 BC. Significantly, Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. You see, God was telling the people to remember. Zechariah 1, verses 1 through 15. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, Just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so has he dealt with us. On the twenty-fourth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. And behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these seventy years? And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. Zechariah chapter 1, verses 1 through 15.
You know, we come upon a prophet who is really um, interesting for us to read today. His prophecies cover the end of time. They do. And he speaks to us, those who are alive now. And this prophecy is more relevant today than ever before, in my view. And so I would encourage you that if you're reading with us, that you stop and listen carefully. Because these prophets, these last few prophets in the Old Testament, are important for us to hear. Not to just read and carry on. But we need to hear them. Now, Zechariah is one of those prophets. It says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah and the, the son of Iddo, saying, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. What would you do if God came to us and said, the Lord is angry with your fathers? What would you do? Would you ask the question, why is the Lord angry? Or would you say, what have my fathers done? Now, that, that's a key question, beloved. We're going to study a little bit of that today. As we continue in this, get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. And if you don't have a Bible guide, you can use the address at the bottom of the screen to write for yours. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. When you go to biblediscoverytv.com, click on Donate. Make a donation in any amount. And uh, God, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name you would help people. Uh, to hear you and make a donation in any amount. And we'll be happy to send you a Bible guide, but you can get your Bible guide on the website as well. Now, this is Zechariah. It's important that we hear what God says. Now, the way that we see this is God watches and waits. God watches and waits. Two things that God is doing. And in fact, I think God is doing that now, but he's not just doing that. He's involved with people who ask him. We read Zechariah 1 to 4. We're looking at Zechariah 1, 1 to 15. Father, I ask today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. Help us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us through his word. So let's go to his word and look at what God says, beloved. Zechariah 1, 1 to 6, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear me, says the Lord. We must listen to God, I'm telling you. Verse 5, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words, my statutes, which I command, my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Beloved, listen carefully. God calls each of us to himself for repentance and to get to know him. When we come to Jesus Christ, we don't just get to know him and that's fine. No, we repent. We say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. You are the king of my life. I have failed. I'm a sinner and I need your help. I say that I'm the biggest sinner in this place right now. Whether you're in your living room or your bedroom or wherever you're at, I'm the biggest sinner. And that's how we have to think. We're not trying to justify ourselves. We're saying, Lord, I need your help. I need Jesus Christ more than anything. That's how we have to think. And that's what Zechariah was saying here. That's what God is saying to us today. Let's go on. It says, on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, he says, I saw by night and behold a man riding on a red horse and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. 
and behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. And then I said, my Lord, what are these? So the angel who took me with, or took me, said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom, listen carefully, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent, the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the world. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro throughout the world. And behold, the earth is resting quietly. Now, I need to tell you something. God is not watching from a distance. No, he's not. God is involved with the people of the earth. He is. He is watching and he is working quietly. Now, he's not broadcasting on the news. Every once in a while, you have a movie like The Passion or something, and God says, here's who I am. But I want to tell you something. God is letting us decide who he is. And we must decide that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what we must decide. Now look at verses 12 to 15. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judea, which you were angry with these 70 years? And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. He said, so the angel who spoke with me said, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great zeal or energy. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry and they helped, but with evil intent. Look, I need to tell you, Jerusalem is the city of God. And God is paying attention to Jerusalem. I want to say this, very important. He watches and waits to see what we will do. We must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We must ask the Lord to speak to us about Jerusalem. We must say, Lord, help Jerusalem to have peace. Psalm 122 is very important. And we are commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Father, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem right now. I pray that I join forces with people who are following you and willing to fulfill your command by praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that you would bring peace there and help there. Amen. Now, may I suggest to you today, beloved, that you listen to the word of God and build into your regular prayer list or your regular life on a daily basis, not just a list of what you need, but remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem every single day, several times a day. Very, very important. Next time on Quick Study Television, we are going to read Zechariah chapter 9. Now, this is interesting because God judges others for coming against his nation. In other words, God defends the nation of Israel. All of that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Join us, won't you? Right? Well, today we're going to be exploring two alleged contradictions in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And here they are. 
One, how could Samuel be sleeping in the temple, as the Bible records, if the temple wasn't built until much later? And two, was Samuel sleeping in the Holy of Holies, where he wasn't supposed to be, as the passage seems to indicate? Let's study. Enemies of the Bible attempt to discredit the scriptures as the revealed word of God by claiming that there are many errors and contradictions within its text. For example, skeptics make two allegations against 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. The NIV Bible's translation of this verse reads this way, The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The first allegation made against this verse is that Samuel appears to be sleeping where the Ark of the Covenant was, in the Holy of Holies where he was not supposed to be. Indeed, the NIV translation reads that Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the Ark of God was. The second charge made against this verse has to do with the word temple. How could Samuel have been sleeping in the temple, critics ask, when the temple was not built until much later? We can find answers to both of these conundrums when we simply read this verse in a different translation of the Bible. The New King James Version of the Bible reads, And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, the Lord called Samuel. This particular translation correctly translates this verse by pointing out that the light was coming from the Holy of Holies while Samuel was lying down, not that he was lying down in this very holy place. Furthermore, this translation uses the word tabernacle instead of temple. Indeed, upon inspection of the original Hebrew word here, hakel, we find that its literal meaning is a large building or edifice. Therefore, this verse is not referring explicitly to the temple of God, but to a place of God, namely the tabernacle which had been erected much earlier. From this we can see that there are absolutely no errors or contradictions in this passage. In fact, these two examples of alleged contradictions greatly demonstrate how difficult a task it is to translate the original Hebrew into English. We can see that these supposed errors are nothing more than issues in some of the English translations of the Bible. It's true, other translations render the word temple as tabernacle, since the original Hebrew word means simply a large building or edifice. The text therefore is not referring to the future temple. Furthermore, exploring other English versions of the Bible reveals that Samuel was certainly not sleeping in the Holy of Holies either. So from this study, it's clear to see that there are absolutely no errors or contradictions here. What's interesting, Ryan, is uh, you begin to think this through and, and you begin to understand it again, uh, go back to the original languages and look at it. And, and, and the idea of a place to keep your uh, sacredness uh, was common and uh, all of that. But what was uncommon was there were no idols in the temple uh, because the temple was originally a tabernacle, which is mm -hmm. a tent. Yeah. And God never commanded that the temple be built. He only commanded around how the temple should be built. But he did command a tent tabernacle to be built. That he did. I mean, he was trying to reestablish his presence mm -hmm. with them. You know, we, I mean, we lost that presence uh, in mm -hmm. Eden. We got cut off from that. So it was God's way of, you know, I think, reestablishing re his presence. Uh, yeah. And really, it was the tent of meeting. Right? Well, yeah. It's supposed it's supposed to be, yeah. Yeah. But it really was, you know, by the people called yeah. the tent of meeting because that's where they would meet with God. You know, and, and to be fair, a lot of people would say, well, the, the Ark of the Covenant is pretty close to an idol. Uh, and that's true. It could easily be seen as an object, a holy sacred object. Uh, and, and definitely the enemies of Israel mm -hmm. saw it as an idol. Mm -hmm. But Israel was not to see it as an idol. It was supposed to be a representation of a meeting place with God. That that mercy seat that they could, that the uh, high priest could could interact with God on mm -hmm. behalf of the people mm -hmm. for, uh, and you know a lot of scholars would actually say that that's why the Ark of the Covenant. They a lot of people think, a lot of theologians think that that might be one of the reasons why the Ark of the Covenant goes missing off the pages mm -hmm. of the Bible is that the people had begun to idolize it mm -hmm. in an un, in an in an unholy way. That's speculation, but it's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. I think that and you that could see absolutely where that could go. Have Especially in today's world. Oh, yes. I think it's important to understand, though, that, that idols themselves were created by people who had images of what they thought their gods looked like and believed. Yeah. And uh, But the Ark of the Covenant was told, God told them how to build it. 
Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you could say, well, it, it, they got instructed that. And then the problem is they say, well, yeah, but you, you're saying that your God instructed that. Well, first of all, he's not my God. He's the God. But I believe that you don't. And you can get into this discussion. But yeah. the fundamental difference is that on this, uh, whatever you call it, the Ark of the Covenant, which is great, uh, you've got two angels, two cherubim looking at each other. And that's where God appears. Mm -hmm. He doesn't stay there. He appears there to talk to them. Right. Uh, but I think I, 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 I do think, you know, you would see in ancient cultures the belief that instructions were originally given to them through divination or whatever means by vision for them to create their idols. But really, you're right. The main difference between the Ark of the Covenant and an idol was in the purpose and the practical application of it mm -hmm. uh, as it not actually representing God, uh, but, you know, close. And I think that's <laughs> interesting. I think I I think it's interesting that uh, other uh, the other false religions had something similar to it, but when you replaced God with an actual idol, it became the worst sin, one of the very worst sins that you could that you could commit. So, yeah. I mean, it, I feel I still think that personally <laughs> that the Ark of the Covenant is uncomfortably close to an idol, but I think God did that on purpose uh, to well, test I mean, because, the intentions of His people's yeah. heart, just as He does with us. I think because today. Moses is at the top of the mountain and God goes by. And, yeah. and it's like, you know, he sees the, technically the way the words say it is that the backside of God, but, uh, but that that's God and he's big and the, the, the sky and all of that and all the people of Israel saw yeah. the sky and everything, but God is brought to this place. And so that's it. There's a couple of differences that are in the practical application of this that are very different. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, very interesting. It is. We're going to have to continue <laughs> this on a tape or, or on a, not a tape, but a DVD or something. Showing your age How there, are you, man? man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I've been through, anyway, no, That's never mind. Right. Don't digress DVDs too far. DVDs or Blu-rays, whatever. The eight cassette track. Oh dear, That's, that, those were the best. She knew eight right track. where the pause, the eight track, you knew right where the pause was coming. Before it switched. Right, be in the middle of the song. I've got a minute left. So yes. we're gonna fire off this question. fabulous Friday question. It could be a bit confusing only because there's colors involved. Uh -oh. What color were the three horses mentioned in Zechariah 1 verse eight? Red, sorrel, and white. Red, sorrel, and black. Or black, Sorrel and white. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. What do you have? I have no idea. Me neither. Do you? Uh, so second one. Second one. No, first one. First one. The first one. <laughs> We're gonna we go all saw with that the first one. There. It's yeah, first actually one. a good answer. Good, good job, Dad. Red, sorrel, and white. You will find that in Zechariah chapter one, verse eight. Well done. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you in tomorrow's program. See you later.